I will finish with the wasteland. And I have a uh, uh, recording of Eliot reading his own poem, which really needs to be read aloud uh, because it has many different voices and many different accents even. Uh, and um, uh, but I will uh, start with easier things, uh, which include my own things. But uh, let me just give you a brief rundown uh, about uh, uh, the sequence here. Uh, in a way, I'm going backwards. Uh, historically, Eliot wrote his piece first. Uh, it uh, was done, uh, much of it during the Second Wo uh, First World War, and uh, finally published in 1923. But I will tell you the story when we get there. Uh, Brecht's work was done in the 20s also, uh, much of it. Uh, his famous Threepenny Opera, for example, in collaboration with his musician friend, Kurt Weil. Um, uh, has anybody seen the three, Threepenny Opera? It, you should see it or you should hear it. Uh, it's really quite interesting. Uh, and then Paz's work uh, really began in a way in the 30s. Uh, Neruda certainly uh, um, uh, would date from the 30s. Uh, both Paz and Neruda wrote in Spanish, but Paz's work came out in 1955. And then, of course, uh, we were not even around at that time. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, my work is much later, of course, uh, uh, and much less significant than, than their work, I would say. Uh, 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 but. Uh, uh, my work is my struggle with, uh, uh, with making sense of uh, our world, uh, uh, which uh, is our shared world in, in many ways. Uh, but maybe I should get into my, my, my part also in a way through music. Um, uh, because in, uh, in uh, the course of my own undergraduate years, uh, uh, I went through many intellectual and, uh, and emotional experiences, and uh, uh, I felt very confused. Uh, and then when I finally got around to the existentialists, I decided that universities were very inauthentic. Uh, so I decided to drop out. Uh, and I, um, uh, I didn't regret it. I, in fact, looking back, I think that probably was the uh, freest uh, uh, chunk of time I ever had in my life. Uh, I lived in poverty, but it didn't seem like poverty at that time. Uh, I lived in Greenwich Village for a while, uh, and then I went to France, and I lived uh, in France. And uh, since I didn't have much money, uh, one friend suggested that I should pick up my singing career again and, 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 and sing to, to earn some money. And it just turned out that uh, some people on the right bank also liked me, so I'd go to the right bank and and, and put on the right clothes and sing for those rich people and make quite a bit of money. And then I'd come to the left bank and, and sing in those dives for my friends, uh, have a lot of fun, but very have you know, earned very little money. But I didn't need very much money at that time. Um, so anyway, first, uh, let me play you something that I sang uh, on the right bank, which is from, I think, uh, maybe it's from 1950s, uh, Blue Velvet. Uh, there's a cult movie called Blue Velvet. I don't remember the name of the director, but he's quite famous, uh, uh, and the song figures there. I'll just play, play, uh, play a little part of this, because we don't have time, and I want to get to uh, the more important poets and not spend so much time on myself. Uh, but it will give you some flavor of, of maybe uh, 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 how music means something uh, uh, sometime.
So uh, I guess it was not such a long song. So, uh, uh, but uh, on the left bank, <laughs> uh, uh, we had more fun doing different things. And I'll play you part of one. It's a Simon and Garfunkel song, I think. Um, and then maybe a little snippet from, from a song some English musician taught me. Uh, but I've forgotten his name. I'll have to re He was actually quite well known, but I don't remember his name. You know the song, so uh, we don't need to go to the end. Now, this other song is called The Streets of London. It's about down and out people in London. Do you know, the rem the, have you ever heard this song? OK, I'll find out. I, I'm sure uh, there must be some source of information somewhere. But you can uh, hear on jazz. And after a uh, judge, and after that, uh, there is a song, short song by uh, Joan Baez, actually, was the one who taught me. Uh, uh, really wonderful artist, uh, wonderful woman. Uh, uh, it's a folk song, Donna, Donna, Donna. It's written by some, uh, some Jewish uh, uh, writer, I think. Uh. Kicking on. 
papers, in his worn out shoes. In his eyes you see no pride, and helplessly by his side, yesterday's paper telling yesterday's news. So how can you tell me you're lonely, and say for you that the sun doesn't shine? Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. Have you seen the old girl who walks the streets of London? Dirt in her hair and her clothes in rags. She's no time for talking, she keeps right on walking. Carrying her boat to, to carry her bags. So how can you tell me you're lonely and say for you that the sun doesn't shine? Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. The same old man sitting there on his own, looking at the world over the rim of his teacup. Each ten lasts an hour as he wanders so alone. So how can you tell me you're lonely and say for you that the sun doesn't shine? Let me take you by. Memory fading with the metal ribbons that he wears. In our winter city, the rain cries a little pity. The one more forgotten hero in a world that doesn't care. So how can you tell me you're lonely and say for you that the sun doesn't shine? Let me take you by.
okay, that's it. For me, that, that line, whoever treasures freedom like the swallow has learned to fly, always really uh, has been very moving. And what is human rights, really, but treasuring freedom? Um, but freedom, it may come trippingly on the tongue, but it's very difficult to define and even more difficult to defend. But we'll try. Okay, uh, now to go from that to a prose piece and then to poetry uh, and uh, in the context of human rights um, in an ecological way. Uh, I wrote this piece, Waiting for the Sun, uh, at a very young age. I was a teenager when, when I wrote this. I don't know if you can, if you can tell that from reading. Um, and uh, uh, I was precocious, I, I suppose, but, uh, 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 but those feelings really uh, uh, were very perplexing to me. Uh, and I read a lot of Tagore at that time uh, of my life. And one of his poems is called Questions, Krishna, which means, which can mean singular question or plural questions. I felt that he actually had more than one question there. So <laughs> I, I translated this as questions. And these four lines that I put on the top occur uh, at the very end of this poem. Those who are poisoning your air, those who are putting out your light, have you forgiven them all? Do you? Do you still love them all? I think anybody who really cares about nature, cares about humanity, uh, cares about uh, 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 all kinds of wrongs that we see around us, uh, the, all the cruelties, uh, small and large, that people meet out to other people and animals and, and, and inanimate nature uh, or what they think is inanimate nature must puzzle us and, and make us ask these questions. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, at one point, uh, uh, reflected on uh, what Hamlet says in, uh, uh, in the graveyard, you know, when, uh, of course, Hamlet is a very confused and confusing character, very complex character. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this particular part expresses one side of Hamlet and one side of Shakespeare, one side of Renaissance, I think. Uh, not the darker side, but the brighter side, uh, when Hamlet uh, exclaims, What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form, in moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Of course, uh, Hamlet is more complicated and he knows better uh, without knowing always, uh, and that's part of the dramatic irony uh, and poetic irony. Uh, of, of Shakespeare. Uh, but uh, I was really deeply troubled. Uh, so if you have read this, uh, you were not surprised uh, by what I told you about my dropping out of, of, of college. <laughs> I'm sure anybody who, uh, who has reflected on uh, the kind of uh, hypocrisy uh, that we, we are asked to live uh, and accept must feel from time to time like dropping out if it were possible. So here is what I wrote uh, then. The midday sun of our civilization burns. It burns in this smoke-filled, copper-colored sky. Also burn with it the pages from the book of our dreams. The petals of the red, red rose become prematurely and preternaturally natu pale. In the world filled with the pain of suffering men and women, the noise from the factories drown out the cries of the human heart. In this age of near universal commodification, man has become completely deformed in the pursuit of money, which is the ultimate symbol of all commodities. It is no wonder that the young men and women of our times are confused, anxious, full of doubt. 
we experience the anxiety born of the conflict between the quest for a life that is authentic and one that is materially comfortable but full of deep malaise and unease. And uh, of course, this is, I, I was not the first one ever to feel that way uh, uh, or even to express it in this way. Uh, there is a bit of touch of uh, romanticism there also, uh, influence of the romantic uh, poets and, 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 and thinkers. Uh, not all of which I think uh, uh, one has to reject even when one grows out of it as I did. Um, I also uh, reflected a lot on, on, on uh, loneliness uh, of uh, uh, all of us. And so I wrote, uh, the individual is exhausted by the violence outside, but there is yet another poison that works its way inside through the human mind. Lost in herself, war-torn, vanquished, the individual is like the ancient mariner, alone, alone, all alone, in a wide, wide sea. In desolate islands of loneliness, each one of us is a lonely guard. So separated are we from one another, so torn are we, by a battle between our yea-saying and nay-saying parts that neither our thought nor our work has any semblance of a natural balance. We are, as it were, in a surrealistic hurdles race, in an absurd comedy of errors that is also tragic in equal parts at the same time. Therefore, old traditional values are completely useless in our age that is why so many like Mersault of Camus are simply present absent. In the sea of doubt, virtue, vice, theism, atheism, good, evil, all these moral and metaphysical oppositions seem pointless. Indeed, in the prematurely aged sight of our generation, they seem like cruel metaphysical and moral jokes that are being played on us by an impersonal phallic father. Thus, the soldier in our age can offer himself only merciless self-criticism that is really cruel self-deprecation. Nine soldiers out of 10 are born fools, which is a line from George Bernard Shaw. But then, uh, is there no way out? That is the question that I, I, I raise at the end, and I don't want to give up. For so many historical epochs, through the ages, did this same civilization bring forth the message of love, equality, and solidarity to men and women? Otherwise, how was it that people like Christ and Buddha came to us? What made it possible to have this procession of noble souls? What is the place of the human in today's civilization? Is the domination of the machine or control by the merely external unstoppable like an ineluctable modality of nature? Is there no way for the seemingly hopelessly imprisoned man to become autonomous? Perhaps there is a way. True, today the poet is lost in confusion, the philosopher wrapped up in futile abstraction, the scientist a toy in the hands of the financiers, the oppressive state and the warlords. No white dove of peace is visible in this utter darkness of despair. Indeed, we know without any illusion whatsoever that next to all desire, like a wall, waits the face of death. Still, there can be a hope that is not so naive as to deceive itself with cheap religious or political slogans. Even as the mechanical life rolls on it, in its steamroller, life-smothering fashion, even if the conspiracy of power between the mechanical men and machines of self-destruction blacken the open sky and deaden the very air that we need to breathe, there will always be a small window open in some corner of our minds. Thus, even in the midst of terrifying despair, the light of a stubborn, hopeless hope can burn brightly. I put my trust in the possibility of developing a new consciousness and morality 
that will enable us to think and act with genuine compassion instead of the lies, half-truths, and hypocrisies of the so-called world religions and philosophies, we must look deeply into our heart and find there a source of a new, higher morality and wisdom. Only this will give us collectively a fighting chance to evolve into full and free human beings who can truly say yes to life from the depth of their soul. As Tolstoy observed, our life is a succession of deaths and resurrections. We die to be born again. As it is with self-conscious individuals, so it can be with our entire civilization. That is why I am waiting for a new sun to rise, a new sun that will flood this dying blood-red planet with myriads of white rays of joy and peace, a sun that will beacon us all towards an effulgent outpouring of new life out of the anxious despair of today. Perhaps this new republic of peace will come only after much further sacrifice of innocent lives. Perhaps a new Vagirath will bring forth a new Ganges to dr drown the dark landscape.